All right, excited for this episode of Changing Lives, Selling Knives. I have my original mentor, Joe Cardillo, who's the general manager for Vector Canada. How are you doing, Joe? Hey, spectacular, Trent. Uh, as you mentioned, original, we've been working together for 26 years, and we've had a lot of fun from the beginning, and I'm sure today is going to be a lot of fun, too. I actually just, I'm just, let's just dive right, right in there. So, Joe, you started in 1988 as a sales rep, but you didn't start in Canada. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was really wonderful. I had an opportunity. I was a student uh, at university working as an ID checker in the school gym. Saw, saw a poster for uh, Vector back in uh, where my family was living in Grand Rapids, Michigan. and got started in that summer in 1988 and became an assistant manager in 89. And the number one organization in Vector back then uh, was some extremely powerful people like Amar DeVay, Jeff Kunkel, Tim McCready, Jeff Fry, TJ Potter, and led by our region manager, Marty Dimitrovich. Couldn't have been a better place to start than when I started in 1988, that's for sure. That's a crazy rogues gallery, man. That is, uh, if you've uh-huh. been around Vector at all, that even just, the, just being around Marty Dimitrovich for a summer or two is, uh, is pretty spectacular. And then you moved to Canada uh, when they launched, except for the fact that you were the only one that wasn't like a career move you were still a student and you ran a branch office in Canada that summer. Tell us a little bit about how, how does that happen? Sure. Well, fortunately for me, I, uh, I was a Canadian citizen, born Canadian, but a dual citizen. So I grew up in Toronto area till I was 13, moved to Michigan where my mother's family was from and got started, as I said, with Vector. And uh, I remember that at the time, Bob Haig, was in charge of some of the expansion and and they had said hey maybe joe could go and they said oh we're really looking just for district managers those as you mentioned out of school career oriented people and so i was a little disappointed and uh, because i'll never forget my thoughts after i heard about canada i actually woke up in the middle of the night thinking to myself man if this cutco stuff sells in the united states it's going to sell in canada and and called my district manager at two in the morning. He wasn't as enthused as I was with my revelation, but uh, he understood my enthusiasm. But as time went on, I think Bob Haig and some other people found out I was a Canadian citizen, so they wouldn't have to do all the paperwork. So I got that call and uh, they said, hey, we'd love you to be a part of that startup team. And that originally started from a special dinner I had with Marty Dimitrovich. And I know he's been mentioned on previous podcasts. He, he, made such a mark in my life and in my heart uh, for all that he did uh, teaching me and so many others. And he was someone that, as an assistant manager, took me out to dinner and said, hey, uh, we could have an opportunity for you to go back to Canada. And I got to tell you, my first reaction way at the beginning was, well, maybe after I graduate, I think I want to stay close in this division. There's so many great people stay by my district yeah. manager. And then I got that revelation that, hey, this is the time to go. So uh, had the opportunity to be part of the startup team in Canada under the leadership of Joe Grushkin and really probably in the history of our company, not too many people more innovative and uh, unique in ways to bring excitement and energy to the business than Joe Grushkin. Learned a lot from him. And uh, yeah, we kicked it off in 1990. As you've often heard me share, Trent, we ran the number one branch office in Canada in 1990. And uh, we were the only branch office in Canada in 1990. Nice but uh, nice we got the trophy. So we had some <laughs> fun and actually crazy story, Trent. Uh, I was reading the paper the other day and there was a gentleman that's a president of a solar company. And I looked at his name and I said, that guy was my number one rep in the summer of 1990. And I looked him up on LinkedIn. We connected. His office is one block over from our current office. We've relocated to. And uh, we went out to lunch just earlier this week and reconnected about now he's president of a solar company he founded and uh, how valuable his Cutco experience was to him. So what a powerful connection after 30 years. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah. So you had a great summer and uh, you went back to school that fall. And uh, what was the thinking there? I mean, you, you had a great summer. Were you thinking about maybe uh, sticking around? Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? I had finished three years, uh, went to school to be a teacher and then switched over to finance. And uh, thought in my mind after, you know, halfway through that summer, hey, university is about getting a job. And I had a job, one that was going well. So I said to the national sales manager, Joe Grushkin, I said, hey, I'm going to stay open. And I thought he 
receive that well. Like, hey, sure. great, we could use you. And he said, Joe, it's not an option. He goes, you started that, you got three years in, you got one more to go, you're going back to school. And I battled him for a while and I realized not too many people battled Joe Grushkin and win that <laughs> argument. And I said, okay. And he goes, we're going to have a great opportunity for you when you come back. And uh, not only did he have a great opportunity for me as a district manager when I came back, I met my wife today, Jennifer. Uh, not like I had a wife before, but this is my <laughs> only wife. But I met her uh, in October that year. And uh, we got married uh, not that far after. And we've been married now since 19. 19- 92. So uh, it served me so well. And that's one of the lessons that I've tried to instill in so many of the people that I've worked with and, and, and other managers in Canada that, uh, you know, we can be patient for people and help them do the right thing, even when maybe short term, uh, it might not be the best thing for the business. If it's best thing for people, it always works out pretty good. Well, and, and Jen Cardillo uh, is probably one of the best parts about Joe Cardillo. Is if you've met Absolutely. Jen, you know what we're talking about. So that's a that's a nice <laughs> nice yeah. pick for the degree. Uh, even better, uh, wind up with Jen. That's that's terrific. So yeah. now, hold on. You had an opportunity in Canada. You met Jen. She wasn't from Canada. How what how how that work out? Well, I just assumed as a naive dual citizen person that I'd marry her and she'd become Canadian, but we had a process to go through to sure. make her a landed immigrant. But we got married at the end of 92, moved to Calgary to start the expansion. We had never sold Cutco in Western Canada, uh, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and the prairies there, and uh, got married, went to Jamaica, and moved out west. And I know Jen's got a great place in your heart, Trent, because I was on a staff meeting in Toronto when I said, Jen, who had never sold Cutco, uh, hardly even used the knives up to that point. I said, I need you to go in. I need you to pre people from this interview and schedule them when I'm back as a married couple just starting the brand new business with no development. And uh, wouldn't you know that uh, that day she pre's Trent Booth, <laughs> the only interview, the only day she's ever worked in a vector office. And I got a feeling you came back, not necessarily just because of uh, the opportunity in Vector, but you were hoping maybe to see my wife again back there in 19, uh, it's real. 1993, <laughs> that's for sure. So what a, what a fascinating twist of events for that story. Eh? And a tremendous leader, it really is. It's good. Uh, <laughs> we, can, we can thank uh, Jen Cardillo for that. One and done. Uh, yeah. So tell me about a little bit more about uh, 1993, because that was the year that I started. That's a year that uh, many that listen to this podcast would recognize the name uh, Vonnie Fast, whose career sales are now well over, th- I mean, $5 million? Where is she at? $5 yeah. million. Dollars. Closing on six, yeah. I mean, just, a, just a, a career beyond Hall of Famer. I mean, one of the top all-time sales reps of Cutco Cutlery starts in your office in uh, that spring of 1993. I started uh, right around that same time. And yet, if you're looking at, you know, Angie McDougal starting within a year of that as well. You might go, wow, that must have been an amazing season of, of life for you, Joe. You newly married, you move out west, and, and uh, that year was not gangbusters for you in your sales career. Can you tell us a little bit about just overcoming some of that adversity in 93? Well, I think in my career that's now spanned quite a few years, that uh, without a doubt was the most challenging year that I faced. And uh, just got married, had been successful as a branch manager, number one district manager, saved some money, fortunately, and uh, went out there and we had some, uh, some challenges to overcome uh, the way we had to advertise over there. Some of our veterans in the Cutco business, remember that was the year we took away receptionists and added a machine and uh, had some things to navigate. Uh, I also had a wife there that that was used to products that were sold in the United States that weren't sold in Canada. And it was a big adjustment as much as we think U S and Canada, the same and married life. And, and, you know, we did in that, in that whole entire year, you know, what we had done in a few months in the, or, you know, in the year before. Uh, So uh, I'll never forget our national sales manager, Joe Grushkin came out and was expecting to see a lot of bad things at the end of our our year at the year on banquet and he met you Trent he met Bonnie he met some of the other people uh, and said wow there are some really good people there and I I think that was a great lesson for me to learn is that development or having great people is not always correlated with high sales or high performance sometimes you can have high performance but not always the people that you can build with uh, sometimes you do but sometimes 
uh, they're there even when the overall results aren't aren't there. And that's what we had. Uh, you know, you've had such a story career, impacted thousands and thousands and thousands of people throughout Canada, the United States, with your role as you grew in Vector to the role that you've had so many years as a as a leader and the trainer of leaders in our organization. As you mentioned, Bonnie's I think top five career Cutco salespeople, and then. Angie started in 1994, part of our turnaround, and to be the uh, first, the highest ranking woman executive in the history of our 70 year old company. Uh, and, and, and we know we could label some really other cool people that were a part of it, but uh, yes, yeah. here 25 years later, you know, uh, you know I, I was telling you what a great day it is for me to spend time with you, Trent, and I just got off a call with Bonnie and Angie uh, just before you. So a real special day for me, that's for sure. Joe, we've spoken often about, and I want to get back to that 1994 year because we legitimately went from worst uh, to first. So that, I think that deserves a conversation. But just thinking about your your career path, originally being a teacher and then deciding to do this knife thing, you know, and uh, what were some of the areas of overlap there? What were some of the things that, that, that inspired you about becoming a teacher that you've been fulfilled with here at Vector? Well, I think what inspired me, I had a great experience going through high school and, and with teachers and coaches and playing sports. And I thought that that was an opportunity where I could make a difference for people. And uh, like I said, that's what I started university at. And, and I share people, I switched to finance because early on, I, I got an impression that, wow, you could teach, you know, so much of vector or so much in sales management is teaching others mm -hmm. and I saw how much money you could make in back there and I wanted to know what to do with the money I could make if I could be successful with this and it was in that time out west where I ran into a gentleman that uh, it was a teacher working with us on a, his summer holidays and I mentioned to him hey I went to school to be a teacher changed my path and he shared with me the idea that as a teacher he could influence someone for a semester or maybe even a full year depending on the grade he was teaching but he could see with the organization we were building, the impact a leader and vector could have for years and uh, much more than just a, a semester or a year and the ability to teach them much more than the subject, you know, to help them in business, help them in life. And he saw that in action. And his name is Neil Hudick and I'll never forget the conversation we had uh, back in one of those summers. And uh, it's fascinating today. His his son is a district manager candidate in our organization out of our Edmonton office today, the full circle. I guess when you're around a long, long time, those are things <laughs> that can happen. But so uh, I, think, I think our executives in our business and executives in other leadership companies, uh, companies in leadership roles realize that teaching is a, is a vital aspect. And, uh, and, and I know in Vector, I've received so much education from doing better in the business to doing better as a father, better uh, relationships with my family, my spouse, and uh, you know, love making a difference. And that's something we do in our business. Well, Joe, I just want to thank you for the, all those investments all these years. I mean, it's not the end of our call, but just the ways that you've encouraged me and made a difference in my life. I know that I'm a better dad. I'm a better husband. I'm a better son, even just uh, through your influence and having a chance to study under you. And I just remember thinking in 1993, I'm like, if I could just say, spend some time with Joe Cardillo, I'm going to be a better man. Like I'm going to be a better guy if I can just get some time with him. And uh, that's where I was so excited to be your, your pilot manager in 1994, where I could really study it. Joe's feet and just kind of uh, study leadership and how to run the business right and how to treat people uh, right as well. So we had, we had Angie McDougal or back then Angie Buckingham start off uh, in April of that year. Would you say that would be the, the, the siege or the starting point of the turnaround or, or did, was it before the results came? You know, I'll share with you, uh, she definitely played a role and continued to play a role ever since, as you know, Angie. But I've shared with other managers I've worked with through the years, and I think it's applicable to whatever business someone's in, deciding when to stay and when to go. And in 1993, we had bought a house, moved out to Calgary, really invested, and the business wasn't going our way. I was spending more money than making money at times. And rather than just going, I'm, I'm out of here, or uh, a bad day, bad week, it's over, I said, this is the deal. I'm going to give this business to the end of the summer of 1994. And at the end of that summer, either as Marty Dimitrovich would, Dimitrovich would say, 
you know, uh, you're growing, uh, you're having fun, you're making money. If you can meet those three criteria that he shared with me as a young person, why to stay? Uh, if I'm there, then I stay. If not, I go. And, and sometimes when people are struggling, they're just caught up in the struggle. And to set a date that says, this is where I want to be making a lot of progress, uh, it frees you to say, I'm not going to be thinking about this every day. I'm going to be working on what it takes to succeed. So I think what well, partly helpful was setting that date. And I shared it with my wife and she agreed and, and uh, we went for it. And then as the world conspires, I mean, your role as pilot manager, Bonnie blossoming, you know, our, we moved to Edmonton, you know, that, as you say, worst to first, we went from the worst to every number one uh, in the company in our region in Canada, we had from rep, branch, district, division, office, we had them all. So uh, she uh, she definitely uh, served as a catalyst. But, but we had we had a lot of we had a lot of fire word there ready to go, you know. And yeah, that's yeah. kind of that example priming that pump, right? We yeah. were priming it and priming it and priming it, and then boom! And uh, you never know how close you are to great things. And uh, we made it through. Well, Joe, a, a significant moment in my career was getting to the end of that first summer, uh, really the end of that first year as a, as a pilot manager, and I was getting ready to open up a district, and there were opportunities in our division to stay. And it probably would have been better for that division if I stayed and went to like Saskatoon or Regina or maybe even split Edmonton or Calgary. Um, but Montreal opened up as a territory, and as we sat down, it, you never blinked. It was never a thought that you were going to do anything but try to get me to that other territory outside of your division. And we weren't even going to get to work together very much at that point. Uh, tell us a little bit about your thinking there, because that is counterintuitive in business and even a business as, as giving generous as ours. Tell us a little bit about your thinking there. Two words, Marty Dimitrovich. He sat down with me as an assistant manager like you were, and we were in a record-breaking office, at least for the month of May, back when I was an assistant. And he had that same conversation with me to leave not only his the division, his region, but to go to a different country. And uh, that thoughtfulness, that caring for others, knowing what was best for them, that, that was the way that was shown me. So it was so easy for me to show it to others because I wouldn't have been in the place of success that I was uh, at the speed of success growing in a brand new organization in Canada as the opportunity that I had. So it was really easy because it was shown to me. Man, well, I appreciate it because if I don't go to Montreal, I don't meet my now wife. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't have the kids that we've had or the life that I have. Yeah. The role yeah. now as a coach and a training leadership development manager here in the states. Again, you were advocating for me again in in 2003 to be able to uh, make the move down here, which is maybe another story for another time. But uh, thank you for being just such a great advocate and uh, not only a great mentor for me, but sponsor really in so many ways. We've mentioned Marty Dimitrovich a couple times as well as. Uh, Joe Greshkin, you've had some other uh, outstanding mentors. You might even have the distinction of having probably the most uh, powerful list of mentors in, in Vector. Uh, Can you walk us through some of the other mentors you've had in the business? Well, I, I'm going to propose you make my tagline on this podcast, the luckiest guy in Vector <laughs> Cutco's history. Because as you mentioned, I had the opportunity to be in the number one division with the Amar DeVays, Jeff Kunkels, Tim McCready's, Jeff Rise, PJ Potters. Uh, under the leadership of Marty Dimitrovich, and then from there, Joe Grushkin in Canada, then worked directly with Don Frieda, the founder of Vector, and, and he was a part of our functions in Canada, then worked directly with him. And then from uh, Don Frieda, I had the opportunity to work with Mike Lancelot, one of the former CEOs of our organization, and learned so much from him and the way he developed others. Uh, then the opportunity uh, for one year, I reported to the two current presidents, Bruce Goodman and Al Leonardo, and what a powerful call that was every few weeks to, to have the exposure to their minds, where Bruce told me as I was a brand new national sales manager, and I was like, I don't know if I'm known to do this, and he said how to do it properly, and he's like, Joe, that's the dirty little secret here is you don't, no one knows when they first get the role <laughs> how it all works. You just push through and keep asking questions and keep learning, and I was like, whew, I'm not the that's only great. one, like, <laughs> in the room that doesn't know everything going on. So that was so helpful. And then mm. from there, I worked directly with Aldi Leonardo, who immediately embraced me as part of his family. And my wife and I have learned so much about raising our children mm. and being a father through Al, who uh, who uh, has taught me endless 
know, things in the business and outside the business. And then from there, I had the opportunity to reunite in new business development to Amar DeVay, who is one of the all-time greatest executives in the history of our company. And from there, now I work directly with Jim Stead Sr. as the chairman of the board of Cutco and Jim Stead Jr. So I think it would be extremely difficult to find someone <laughs> that's been able to be around as many people. The wisdom of the Stitts that I get from the the real caring of people as the owners of the business. Uh, mm. I think most in the Cutco business have a glimpse of it or or know some of it. But when you work closely with them and what's the right decision for the people, and that's their leading cause. It just gives you so much more gratification to know this is the place that I want to be and uh, fortunate to be a part of. Man, we might have to come up with something like the power of mentors. I don't know, man, because mm-hmm. you just had some outstanding people uh, influencing you all these years. And I would say it's, if you were to talk to each of them, they're a big fan of Joe Cardillo as well. I think each of them would say they're better after having worked with you too. Um, and so, Joe, you're, you're having a great time at Vector. You decided to go get the MBA which is not common in direct sales in general. And, and certainly in vectors, not a lot of us run around with the MBA. I say us, but I, I don't have an MBA. Uh, Joe, why the MBA? Well, when you're in a culture, and I, something I've shared as my children become older and work in different cultures, is it, it's great if you're really motivated and driven for personal growth, but it's even better when you're driven and you're around other people. And, you know, in our culture, if you're not, doing an Iron Man, if you're not uh, writing a book or leading a charity, it's like, man, you feel like you're lame or something. So, you know, the, the pursuit of personal growth has been a part, you know, Don Frieda, you know, brought that to our business from his beginning. And so I thought it'd be a great challenge, a great opportunity to learn more, to be a better executive. You know, I felt like I was, had some talents in this area. I got training and I wanted to be more well-rounded in, in the MBA program that I did was the idea of being exposed to all the components. And I learned some that I enjoyed and some I said, man, if I run my own business, I got to get people to do this operation stuff because that stuff, uh, working things on the factory line wasn't for me. But I got to tell you, Trent, my biggest takeaway from the the executive MBA that I achieved was realizing how lucky I was. There were engineers, there were so many people in that program that were doctors and engineers, smart, hardworking people that made me look like sometimes like I I didn't work that hard compared to the early mornings they would go to work and the late. And, and it made me go, this is the road less traveled, Mm -hmm. you know, and I was the little odd guy. There wasn't a lot of knife selling people in this MBA program and it was the road less traveled. And I was like, I'm okay with this being the road less traveled because the biggest appreciation that I got was how special our opportunity. I saw a lot of angry people hmm. and the program was based out of Toronto with a lot of the corporate headquarters and they did a HR study as they prepared people really to leave companies and hmm. anger was one or two in most everybody. And, and ultimately I think in the small world, if someone anger at company A was going to go work at company B and <laughs> someone who was frustrating B was going to go work at A. Sure. But I'm like, wow, I actually have people that I enjoy working with that treat me well and give me opportunity to grow. And, uh, and then I appreciated the income opportunity that sales because I saw some of these engineers. I'm like, man, they're smart as unbelievable, but they didn't bring in revenue, you know, so they're only making so much money. So it left me, you know, besides an education, such a greater appreciation of what I found and fortunate to have found it at such a young age. So then, uh, you haven't done the Ironman yet, but you started a charity. All right. So the Basket Brigade, tell us a little bit about that. Well, this has been a, a program that's had so many people help. Sherry Dickey and our organization here has been a leader. This is going to be our 11th year wow. uh, with the Basket Brigade. And for those of you that are growth fans, this is a branch of the Tony Robbins organization. So no credit for starting it, but we run it for our city. And, uh, you know, and it doesn't matter where you're listening to this podcast there's poverty. And uh, we know in our city, uh, there's poverty. And by helping serve families at Christmas times with baskets of food and, and uh, other offerings that we give them, we're not solving poverty. But as Steve Jobs said, sometimes you just want to put a dent in things. And uh, it's something that my wife's been involved with, my children have played parts in it, we've brought together, you know, it started with just a handful of people in our office. And now we have 
we have hockey teams helping us. We have people outside, you know, it's just grown because I think people want to be a part of something as Don Frieda said, people want to be a part of something that's positive, that's growing, that's making a difference. And we found a charity that resonates with a lot of people and some people want to do good. They just don't know how to do good. And we've provided them an opportunity to do good and, uh, uh, and doing our little dent. So Joe, the basket brigade specifically, we put food together for people during certain times of the year. Is it just at Christmas time then? For us? Yeah. I think in the U S they sometimes it's U S Thanksgiving that sure. they do it or Canadian Thanksgiving, some of the organizations, we do it at Christmas time. We've partnered with another group that does toys uh, for, uh, for families. They use gently used toys. It's a great story of a family where a seven-year-old said, wow, I have these toys that are good, but I just don't use them. What if we gathered them? And through his friends and connection, they gathered hundreds of toys. And now they do it every year to support the, the families uh, that we serve and uh, also beyond the families we serve. So it's uh, it's a basket brigade, but the, because of the generosity of the people we work with, it's usually more than one basket, yeah. and it's not just Christmas dinner. They have food for quite a few weeks with the generosity that we gather together. Well, you may not know this, Joe. I'm not sure if I've ever shared. Uh, there was a year where my dad had tried to become an entrepreneur. It didn't work, and they drove cab that, that December, mm -hmm. and uh, we benefited from people bringing food over for, for Christmas mm -hmm. for us. And uh, Even as a, as a man now with, with uh, teenagers – that still impacts me today to think of the kindness of a group of people that didn't meet us, didn't know us, but they, they were generous and gave, and we were able to enjoy that amazing dinner. It's pretty sweet turkey that year when, when, uh, when you know, there's a chance we weren't going to have one, and we, we just were eating something mm. that somebody gave to us. So thanks for that work, Joe. I know you're just being faithful and doing, uh, you know, what you think is right, and, and uh, I can imagine for you the benefit of just getting that community together even within that basketball brigade. must be something that's pretty sweet, eh? It sure is. I mean, we all share, but the, the big winners, it's sure nice the families receive the food, but it makes Christmas special for every family that's involved. And it's not just Christians. We have some Muslim families that help. Uh, they've played a big role in, in contributing. It's bringing our community together to make a difference. And, uh, you know, the Tony Robbins philosophy is that, you know, receive this basket and someday that you could do this for someone else. And we've had times where someone receive the basket and then help contribute to the basket brigade in future years. Or I make that call and they go, you know what, Joe, no need for the basket this year. I got it, you know, give it to someone else. And, and that's really gratifying to know people have used that uh, to help them get to that next step in life. Because sometimes real successful people can think if it's meant to be, it's up to me. And, hmm. you know, those things happen in life that not everybody can control. And like you said, your family, I, you, you got a great family and, you know, you just did a downtime and you just need some little boost. And if you don't get that boost, maybe it could go down and down, you know, sure. but you get the boost that, Hey, people, I don't even know care about me. Uh, it can make a difference. And yeah. That's a great thing about our company too. It's just one of thousands of things people in our company love doing to help others because leadership is not just being a leader in your business. The world needs leaders. Our communities hmm. all need more leaders. And, I hope what we do here in, in our small piece of the world is help develop leaders uh, for all the areas in life where we need them. Joe, I feel like I'd be missing a massive opportunity here. And I did say A earlier, so I might have to <laughs> get Canadians on a podcast. We're going to say A. Uh, but if we're talking about uh, Canadian, uh, the organization there, and the fact we've got Angie McDougal there as the national sales manager now. She's the top, um, uh, most promoted, decorated um, woman leader in, in Vector's history, and she's not alone now. So she's kind of pioneered some, but we've got, we've got something special happening in Vector Canada. Can you explain to us a little bit about what's happening with women leaders in Vector Canada? Well, I think, I think everybody benefits when there's leaders of all different races and leaders of men and women. And in our business, in our earlier years, it was extremely male dominated and potentially in some pockets it might still be. Uh, but through your leadership, Trent and others, you know, Angie got started and got a foothold in our business. And as she grew more confident, uh, she said, hey, I think there's a way I can do this and have children as an entrepreneur. But it had never been done before. So we're a 70 year old company, but it had never been done. And to see her save money and put people in place and to be able to take a six month maternity leave uh, while her business continued to run and prosper while she was gone, 
uh, let her to have another you know, child and stay within the business. And I think she's identifying others that there are a lot of great women that worked in our organization that left because they never saw there could be a future. So she did it and a blank canvas did it. And so her pilot manager now is a top district manager in North America, has two children, uh, is on the cusp of getting promoted to DVC. Depends when this airs. Uh, <laughs> I'm not spoiling the surprise, but not a surprise. She's earned it. Yeah. And then a district manager in the in that province is is pregnant, expecting her first child, and looking to keep her business forward. So there's Angie and Shayla and Rochelle, and and my hope many more to come that go. Wow, with development and planning and the right people. Wow, this thing is open to bigness for males, females, just just got to get the work done. So she's been a leader in that and a role model for our, our entire company. And I used to say she was the most powerful person, woman in Vector, and I got corrected. She's one of the most powerful persons in, in Vector. I don't know if that's the right English, but uh, uh, she just is. So it's a pleasure to have Male her leadership. Female. She is no question. Male or female. Exceptional Male or female. Ever, yeah. It's yeah. Just pure. So... We've had some pretty great years here, Joe, 26 at least that I've been along the road with you. What, uh, what excites you most about the next, let's say five even, what's coming, what's coming yeah. from Vector? You know, I, I think the thing that excites leaders in, in any business is grow the business and grow people. And in my role as general manager, we have different channels of Cutco being sold. We do certain things online. We have a Costco division. We have the direct sales model. We have People that have been selling Cutco for many years are our top CSPs, and we have all these different channels, and uh, we want to grow them and uh, take them from where they've been to higher levels, and that's creating new opportunities for people and, and helping people grow to assume more leadership roles, to, to take their lives to a, a deeper level and to a greater uh, position of influence. So uh, when I think to the future, I'm excited for what we've done in Canada since 1990, our our first year uh, formally selling Cutco in Canada. Uh, but when I think to the future and the people we have in place now and the visions that we have for the other channels of our business, I'm excited. I'm excited the way my children have grown, you know, two graduated university, one in, one to go into university with our four children and what's in front of them. I secretly, I, I've, uh, you know, you know, you as a father, those of you listening as a father or a mother, you know, you put, a lot of time and energy and there's a lot of pressure being a parent. Mm. I, I look forward to being a grandparent. I, Trent, am going to be the <laughs> best grandfather ever and uh, where I could just love on him and kiss him and do things. I think of Aldo and Nardo the way he must be too as a grandfather and to support them to build their families. And I don't know if that's going to be in five years or not. Uh, I know for my wife, she'd like that to happen sooner than later, but I think they got to get married and figure that stuff all out first. But uh, <laughs> there's some dominoes to I, fall. <laughs> there's a couple dominoes hopefully to fall. So I love seeing my family grow and come together and do things that we can do and have discussions now. So that's been filling. I'm so, you know, my family, my brother, I got a great sister, mom and dad and, and uh, community that I live in. It's, uh, you know, things don't have to get worse as you get older. They just really can get better. And when I think of five years from now, I, and I told you I wanted to be a teacher mm. and, uh, you know, through connecting around good people, a friend of mine's assistant dean at the business school and uh, I brought up idea I wanted to be a teacher. And he said, how about right now? And I was like, really? I was thinking, you know, maybe down late down, down the road. And he's like, right now. And so this fall, I'm teaching at our business college and I'm teaching a class. So I'm going to continue my growth path to be bigger and better than I've been before to help others do the same. So lots to look forward to, Trent. One of the great optimists, Joe Cardillo. Thanks for spending some time. It, it always goes so fast, Joe. And uh, look yeah. forward to getting together again with you really soon, my friend. It'll be uh, hopefully October for you and me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Trent, you do such a great job helping people. And as one of the great ones who I didn't mention today, John Kane, and one of your great mentors and mine too, keep helping people. You do great at that. And thanks for your time. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Joe. Hey, I think that went really